Hello all. Uh, I've been putting this one off just because I don't have an assignment directly associated with it. Although that doesn't mean that it's unimportant. What it means is simply about the only way that you'll be made accountable for watching this is some questions in our quiz. Uh, so no assignments, and I, I don't I couldn't dream up an assignment. What kind of assignment are we going to have about psychopathy? Uh, that was a tough one. It's a fascinating area of study. It's been of interest to me now for probably 20 years. Uh, when I took Dr. Novako's course in forensic psychology at Irvine. Uh, hey, Annika. Did you come up to share in the psychopathy conversation? So, uh, in Novako's forensic psychology class, we had to pick a topic and write a paper. That was pretty much the the biggest portion of the class, and I chose to write about psychopathy. Uh, I enjoyed Novako's conversations immensely. I went to office hours every week uh, with Dr. Novako, sometimes twice a week if he's holding him twice a week. He had his office hours in a nice little cafe there at Irvine, right, up off the ring road, because that's how Irvine's kind of constructed, and he would have office hours at lunch, and he would go eat his lunch, so he always finished class about noon, one o'clock, would do lunch, and the weird thing was, and, and I, I found this out later when I became the teacher, is not too many people come to office hours, and most of the time it was just me and Navaco. And what an incredible experience to sit down with someone's sit down with, with Navaco, with his level of training, his world experience, uh, his experience in, in forensic and social psychology was just fascinating to to be able to spend that time with him. And my interest was in successful psychopaths, and, and I wrote a paper. And I'll tell you what, I've never seen a paper that had the extent of comments that Novak would put on my paper. Uh, maybe one exception when I took a humanities class years and years before that. So uh, thank you, Dr. Novako, for facilitating my interest in psychopathy. Uh, another aside on this, which is already too many asides, but that's just the way I am. I'm sorry. I'm not even really sorry. I'm just being authentic. Uh, the psychology club often asks me to speak, you know, sometimes every semester or, or once a year, whatever it is, and uh, they have again requested, and I say, well, what do you want me to come, and, and what should we talk about? And they say, well, we sure like talking about psychopathy. So I think about seven out of eight of my uh, discussions with Psychology Club at Ohio State have been about psychopathy, and I'm racking my brain for this semester trying to figure out what the hell we should talk about, right? To keep it fresh, keep it new, just not rehash the same old crap. Let's talk about the definition of psychopathy, all right? And this is Dr. Hare, and Hare, there is no one probably who knows more about psychopaths than Dr. Hare and done more research that among the most devastating features of psychopathy are a callous disregard for the rights of others and a pre uh, propensity for predatory and violent behavior. Uh, without remorse, psychopaths charm, exploit others for their own gain. They lack empathy and a sense of responsibility. They manipulate, they lie, they con others with no regard for anyone's feelings. Some people make the argument that they're emotionless. Let's move through this. Uh, and see what we think about that. One of the reasons that I have this uh, lecture, et lecture, it's a lecture, full blown lecture, uh, on psychopathy is often we learn a lot when we study the boundary conditions. And if psychopaths are truly emotionless, isn't that pertinent to a class in psychology of emotion? What are the mechanisms that cause, or the, the lack of mechanisms, that can facilitate emotionlessness in the psychopath? So it's, a, it's an interesting area of study, right? Uh, more from Hare. Compared with, ma uh, with other major clinical disorders, little systematic research has been devoted by, to psychopathy. Even though it's responsible for far more social distress and disruption than all psychiatric disorders combined. Wow. And it would be tough to argue against that statement, right? And we see some psychopaths in, in the world uh, or people who have at least heavy psychopathic traits, behaviors that have been responsible for the deaths of literally millions of people, right? So, And you can go to hair.org. He's got his own website, and you can check it out. There's a 
ton of information on there, and uh, some people might even want to try and study with Dr. Hare, although I think it would be hard to be uh, one of his graduate students, if he's even taking any more. Now, check this quote out. If I wasn't studying psychopaths in prison, I'd do it on the stock exchange. And that's a chilling but accurate thought, right? So... Psychopathy consists of two factors, and the interpersonal affective items are kind of grouped under factor one, and the factor two are impulsive or antisocial items. I think one way to also look at this is factor one is more directly associated with traits, factor two more directly associated with behaviors although there is some overlap and note that strong scoring possession of these traits will typically lead to these behaviors but again fuzzy boundaries so that's just kind of a, a one way to look at it uh, what are the the interpersonal well Psychopaths are often quite charming, and people like to have them around until they've been screwed over or damaged enough that they don't want them around anymore. But they're often fun, and they're often interesting. They have a grandiose sense of self-worth. What's the other name for that as a clinical disorder? Those of you who said narcissism, nicely done. They're pathological liars. They lie, they lie, they lie, and when they're done lying, they lie some more. Right? They're conning. They con people. They manipulate them. Right? They don't take responsibility. I take no responsibility whatsoever. Right? They have an absolute lack of remorse or guilt. It's like those processes don't operate in the psychopath. And I want you to consider what you could get away with if you didn't have a guilt response. It's a scary thought, right? They, they're callous. They lack empathy. And, and central to this course is, is understanding what empathy is. And, and we'll move through that uh, at various points through the course. They have shallow affect, and that's another central concept. Now, we've been talking about emotion, we've been talking about passions, we've been talking about affect. Affect, right, is that, that affective stream. This is the variability, right, in kind of our response to our world. So psychopaths are kind of flatline in this regard. They have shallow affect. It doesn't fluctuate very much, and it's at a minimal level to begin with, right? So the emotional experience you might consider, uh, we might have to refocus here. I got the cats running around, and it looks like they ran into the camera. So... That uh, might be a little better. All right. So, uh, it's maniacal in here right now. The windows are all open. They're, they're all going crazy. Annika and Penelope especially. So, uh, Then let's look at the antisocial items, the behavioral. And, and for those of you who are up on antisocial personality disorder in the, in the DSM, you'll see that there's some qualities here that are, are represented in the DSM. All right. So, psychopaths are often, uh, oh, this is really messed up again, they keep hitting the tripod. So they have a need for stimulation or boredom, uh, you know, they're, they're easily bored, right? And a parasitic lifestyle, so they often won't work, but will just survive off of other people. They have poor behavioral control, so the prefrontal cortex might be implicated. They, they can't really restrain themselves. They will demonstrate early behavior problems. And, and here's where we get into this concept that maybe psychopathy is in, in large part genetic. Right? They have a lack of realistic or, or long-term goals. They often have grandiose plans and all these amazing things that they're going to do, but they are not realistic and they're not willing to put in the effort to actually achieve them. They probably have a history of juvenile delinquency. They demonstrate consistent irresponsibility, and that, that can be in familial responsibilities, work responsibilities, and they tend to be extremely impulsive uh, and, and act on those impulses to a large degree. So let's leave that for a minute and, and talk about instrumental and, and, and reactive aggression. So instrumental aggression is proactive aggression. And, and it's purposeful, it's goal-directed, and, and other pain is often not the goal, but it's to get something that they want, and the means that they will employ will be aggression.
So gaining possessions, gaining status within a group like bullying, right? A lot of times it's not necessarily that the bully is a sadist. It could be that the bully is bullying to gain status from their uh, friends, you know, from, from their clique, etc. Uh, instrumental aggression may be opportunistic. If they see the opportunity or instrumental aggression can be employed to get what they want, then they may f take that out of their toolkit and use it. It can be tied to reward punishment mechanism via socialization. And that is some people become instrumentally aggressive because they figure out that it works. By employing aggression as a child, I see that I get what I want and then continue to use it because I've been rewarded to do so, kind of an operant conditioning mechanism. So now reactive aggression, on the other hand, and this used to be known as emotional aggression, but they've backed off on that term. And Berkowitz is one of the experts on this, so uh, he's adopted this term reactive aggression. It's impulsive or affective aggression. You can see that's kissing cousin to emotional aggression. And, and this is generally a lack of impulse control. Right? So it can be in response to frustration or threat. And, and suddenly, you know, it's triggered and the person is off and running. Notice, triggered by stimuli. Initiated without regard to purpose or potential consequences. And it's often accompanied by anger. So two different types of aggression. Now. Let's talk reactive aggression in animals because you can see uh, where this might be an important model. Reactive aggression in, in, in animals right, operates at three levels. So this is the fight, flight, or freeze. And the lowest level is imagine an animal. You know, take a bunny rabbit. What happens? Well, the bunny rabbit has got those big ears and this is an adaptation because I got big ears and they turn every direction so I can detect sound from a long ways away, right? And, and so I rotate my ears and say, what was that, right? It's distant threat and they'll freeze. They'll freeze to take in more information about their world, right? So you're best able to process your environment when you freeze in your tracks. And look around, listen carefully. Okay? Note, there's a side benefit to freezing as well. For many predators, they detect motion as their primary mechanism for detecting prey. It's through motion. So if you freeze, you're not moving anymore, and a predator might just overlook you if it's not a, a really kind of a great eyesight predator and the wind isn't blowing their way, etc. Now, under moderate level of threat, closer threat, then escape is activated. So the bunny runs like the wind. Okay? But at the highest level, when escape is impossible, when that animal is cornered, then they go to reactive aggression. And that is where they fight. Right? So what do we got? Freeze, flight, fight as the different levels. Now notice, you can observe these same things in human beings. Right? Just another creature in the animal world. So. Reactive aggression in humans, then? It can be demonstrated under conditions of threat, frustration, insult. All of these can activate reactive aggression. And note, it can go through those different levels. Freezing might be first. What did you say? And I'm frozen. I want to gather more information about the situation. Now, the appraisal process for human beings can be kicked in here. And for a lot of us, we say, that guy is big, and he's going to kill me if I say anything more to him. I'm out of here, right? So I go the flight route. But if I'm looking and I'm angry enough, or I have no impulse control or any ability to process rationally, I just might go to the fight mode, right? So the result... Uh, this may be the result of reduced regulation in the executive system, the prefrontal cortex, the inhibitory processes to say, you know what, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that guy could kick your ass, right? I think you should just back off. Or if you get in one more fight, you're going to end up in jail and they're not going to let you the hell out, right? But notice that some people don't have this prefrontal cortex that functions in such a manner, so they in fact then get themselves into trouble. Okay. So neural circuitry may be incapable of mediating the aggressive response. That is, the brain may not be wired to do so. One area I think that might be of interest for study in this regard is those who are born with fetal alcohol syndrome. 
that is when we look at fetal alcohol syndrome babies, we see significant brain deformation. Uh, you know, uh, to what extent does that impair the neural circuitry that can control these mechanisms? As one example, right? And it, it can be the result of emotional impairment. So maybe a fear response isn't really wired properly for this person uh, that would cause one to maybe back off and, and not become aggressive. Oh, by the way, this book here, I love this book, right? It's, it's an edited volume of collected articles, right? And this is the book that was used in large part for uh, preparation of this particular lecture, right? So, you know, in reading our textbook, right, The Social Psychology of Emotion, there's very little said about psychopathy, and I did want to pull it in. So if you're interested, I, I recommend this book. It's out of Blackwell, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. Right. So, uh, and the title, the official title, if you can't read it, The Psychopath, uh, Emotion in the Brain. Okay. Yeah, pertinent to this course, right? Also helped inform for, for psychology and, and law. We talk a little bit about psychopaths in there. Coming to a virtual environment uh, in the spring. So psych, psych and law comes in the spring if you're interested, right? And it will be online, so we're getting prepared for that already. Well, no, I'm not. I'm lying. I'm not prepared for it yet. I'll prepare in December. So uh, Christmas break, there you go. What are we going to be doing for most of us teachers? Or <laughs> we're going to be prepping our, our other classes, right, in our repertoire. So anxiety. Antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy. Anxiety disorders right, are relatively common in those who have antisocial personality disorder as diagnosed in the DSM. No, psychopathy is not in the DSM. Right? If you want to diagnose psychopathy, you have to use Robert Hare's instrument, the psychopathy checklist. Right? So that Hare's the big, the big cheese in that. So 61% of ASPD sample demonstrated symptoms of anxiety disorders. That's a pretty high level of comorbidity, right? 54.3 comor comorbidity over the lifetime in another sample. And it's great when you have two samples, right, from two different researchers that kind of are presenting us with the same conclusion, uh, then, then we can generally express a lot more confidence in those conclusions. Conversely, psychopathy is typically considered to be characterized by a lack of anxiety. And this goes all the way back to Hervey Cleckley, right, who wrote the book The Mask of Sanity, which is now in the public domain. So if you Google Mask of Sanity, you can actually get Cleckley's work for free, right? And then Lichen has been a big time uh, researcher of psychopathy throughout his career. Evidence is mixed, though. Uh, anxiety and fear inversely correlated with factor one psychopathy, and this is why it's important to differ differentiate those uh, types of psychopathy as we suggested those factors. Anxiety is positively correlated with factor two psychopathy. And this leads us to an issue that it's the strong factor one psychopaths that I would consider the true psychopaths that we envision as psychopaths and the ultimately most scary of the bunch, right? So what is going on with psychopathy and how does it relate to emotion? Well, emotional learning and psychopathy. Instrumental learning can be studied by successful acquisition of different types of associations. When we go to learning theory, and those of you who've, who've studied learning theory or had a had class in maybe human cognition, right, uh, or behavioral learning, what, what we see is that we acquire different stimulus response relationships, right, and different response consequence relationships. And, and so whether it's Pavlovian or Skinnerian learning, right, what we're talking about is associations are being built. Now, who else was big on associations earlier in our course, right? And you might say, well, Hume was thinking a lot about associationism as well. This is an old concept, right? Well, one way to study the ability for people to make associations, we can do in the laboratory through passive avoidance learning, and this is studying the formation of associations between a stimulus and reinforcement and object discrimination learning formation of stimulus response associations. So basically we're covering both pieces of ground there. Psychopaths have difficulty with the passive avoidance persisting longer in tasks that present negative outcomes longer than controls. 
So what we do is when we expose people in the laboratory to stimuli that eventually live, lead to overall negative consequences, the controls, those among us who might be considered normal within this context, right, average, we learn and we stop playing the game or we start stop participating in the task because it's like this shit isn't working out and we're associating the mechanisms of the task with the negative outcomes. It appears that psychopaths are not too good at that. So they might continue to engage in activities that generate negative consequences because they are not readily able to form those associations. Now, part of the deal is when we look at something like psychopathy and its acquisition, how do people become psychopaths? It's probably bi-directional, right? So, so in this case, uh, did they become psychopaths because this isn't part of their process? Or because this isn't part of their process, do they go on to develop increased levels of psychopathic traits and behaviors? And it's probably a circular, it's probably bi-directional and self-supporting. Now, Empathy and psychopathy, and, and one thing people have said, well, you know, psychopaths aren't empathetic, so we need to teach them empathy. Cliffhanger time. Hang on, we'll go to part two.